warships, great big moving machines that carry hundreds of men and big heavy weapons into battle. It takes a lot of power and good design to get something this massive moving at all. But going that little bit faster than the enemy can be the difference between life and death. Whether in the Atlantic, Baltic or Mediterranean, naval warfare has transformed the face of Europe. Until 150 years ago, all warships were made out of wood. An obvious choice. It grows naturally, it's readily available in large quantities, and of course, it floats. But even wooden warships, when loaded with men, cannons and cannonballs, weigh thousands of tons. Right, come on then. Once ships had got seriously big, manpower alone was never going to get them moving again. So shipbuilders turned to the wind for power. From the mid-1600s right up to Lord Nelson's victory at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, sea battles were waged between sailing ships armed with cannons. They sailed towards each other in two lines, giving them the name Ships of the Line. The fighting tactic was to fire broadsides at the enemy. That's whole volleys from all the cannons on one side of the ship. Now, carrying heavy guns high above the waterline gave a real risk of capsizing as ships pummeled each other with cannonballs from point-blank range. Fire! I think it's time to get out of here. Row faster, number one. These warships used their massive sails to eke every last bit of speed from the wind, allowing them to defeat the enemy by smashing them to pieces with cannonballs. Then, in the 1840s, there was a revolution in ship propulsion that put an end to this kind of close-quarters demolition derby. Steam power. Steam made it possible to build ships that were stronger, faster and free of the wind, resulting in a new breed of warship. When she was launched in 1860, she was the largest, most powerful and fastest warship in the world, HMS Warrior. Although she may look similar to her wooden predecessors, she was a very different beast altogether. Warrior had three massive masts to catch the wind, but in the bowels of the ship was a steam engine of immense proportions, which made her independent of the wind. The steam to drive the engine came from ten boilers, each heated by four raging furnaces, kept stocked with coal by 66 stokers. Stokers had to work in appalling conditions. Searing temperatures, flames, smoke, and an unbearable racket. And they were expected to shovel over a ton of coal an hour into the hungry furnaces. No wonder they were paid 25% more than other sailors. The steam produced by the boilers drove an enormous trunk engine, a new type of steam engine specifically designed to work with a propeller. Warrior's steam engine had two nine-foot cylinders. It developed over 5,000 horsepower at this end, but by the time it had gone through all the bearings and friction, that figure was reduced to 1,200 horsepower at the propeller. A massive 25-tonne propeller, to be precise, that shoved Warrior's 9,000 tons through the ocean at just over 14 knots. Hmm, sounds fast, but what exactly is a knot? Well, measuring a ship's speed far from land is tricky, but it's crucial for navigation and to know how good your warship is. Back in the 1500s, Dutch sailors worked out how to do it. Being an awkward bunch, sailors have their own version of the mile, which is calculated roughly as 1 60th of a degree around the world, or 1,852 metres. So if you move 1,852 metres an hour, you're doing one knot. With me so far? The system they came up with to measure speed involved a lump of wood, some rope and a 28-second sandglass. Naturally. To test it out, I have my own homemade nautical speedo. It's a bit ropey, granted, but it is very much like the sort of thing that sailors would have used in the 16th century. Sandglass here to measure time, 28 seconds to be precise. A length of rope on a spool, and on this rope, every 15 metres or so, is a mark. A triangular piece of wood attached to the end of the rope, 
which is simply thrown into the water behind the ship. Right, let's uh, get up a little bit of speed and try it out, shall we? And really give it a little bit of the right leg and then get me spool up like that. Chuck that in the water behind me and I think we need to find a faster ship. Right, there we go, looking for the first reef knot. Start the stopwatch, off it goes. Stopwatch going and watching the knots go out. There we are. There's a knot going out. We've done eight seconds now. We're waiting until we reach the 28 second mark. That's how we do the Mads. Looking for the knots all the time. When we reach the 28 second mark, I will stop the stopwatch and of course hang on to my rope and then look for a tag on the rope that will tell me what speed we're doing. There we are, 28 seconds coming up, 28 seconds. I'm hanging on to the rope. I'm hanging on to the rope. I'm looking for the nearest one, which, oh, hello, ah! Oh, there we go, there's our log back. Let's look for the nearest knot, which I can see, there it is. Now, that's one, two, three, four, five, six. But given our bit of a cock up, maybe, we could look to the knot before that, which is five. Let's go and have a look, shall we? See what the speed really was. 5.8 knots. Well, even with the disaster, our experiment has worked. Yes. The crew of the speedy HMS Warrior would have been amazed to see 14 knots pass through their hands as the giant steam engine shoved them along. The two funnels would have belched smoke when under power, but on longer trips when coal was too precious to burn, the funnels would have telescoped down into the deck to allow the wind full access to the sails. The huge propeller was designed to raise out of the water to reduce drag and it took 400 men to raise the 32-ton weight. I bet they love to hear the order. Raise prop, down funnels. On a good day, she could reach a respectable 13 knots under sail alone. It was even possible to run under both steam and sail. When combining the two, Warrior made 17 and a half knots, nearly twice as fast as her predecessors. Steam power made Warrior a fearsome warship. She was able to carry bigger, more powerful cannons than any ship before her, as well as massive amounts of armour. Warrior carried her cannons on one deck, inside what was known as the Citadel. The Citadel was an armoured box made of four inches of wrought iron and 18 inches of teak. It was bolted to the ship's hull, and in tests, no existing weapon could breach this armour. She was simply invincible. Warrior's ability to move free of the wind allowed her to steam into battle, roving at will around the enemy sailing ships, taking pot shots with her powerful cannons, whilst all the while staying out of range of enemy fire. This put an end to close quarters ship-to-ship -ship fighting. HMS Warrior paved the way for a new generation of bigger and more powerful warships. But even as Warrior was being launched in 1860, another weapon was being perfected, and it would make mincemeat of any ship, however well armoured. The self-propelling torpedo. The destructive power of the torpedo made cannonballs look like conkers, and by 1877 led to the development of torpedo-launching boats that were still in use 70 years later during World War II. lethal new breed of small, fast boat was designed to fire torpedoes at the massive warships. Motor torpedo boats, the naval version of David and Goliath. They were deadly and fast, very fast. Motor torpedo boats first burst onto the scene in the late 19th century, and by World War II, they were faster and more deadly than ever before. No 
motor torpedo boat 416 was built by British power boats in 1942. No ships and very few boats could keep up with her. She could simply run rings round the massive warships of the day. So long as the MTBs kept moving, they were a hard target for the lumbering ships to hit. During the war, MTB 416 had three Packard petrol aero engines, each knocking out 1,500 horsepower, a total of 4,500, with half the boat nearly being taken up by engines and fuel. But it was worth it. This huge amount of power, coupled with her lightweight and flat bottom, allowed her to hurtle along at over 40 knots. For her size, MTB 416 is still pretty nippy, even by today's standards. So here I am at the helm of MTB 416. Tremendously exciting. Three huge engines at the back and a fantastic boat that I'm about to drive. And I've got all my dials here, just what I love. Three massive engines and lots of dials. Excellent. Most ships have to push their own weight in water out of the way to move forward. To avoid this, the MTBs were built with a flattened bottom and loads of power. This allows you to push your boat up onto the surface of the water rather than having to force a way through it. It's called planing and allows you to go much faster than any normal ship. Oh, there we are. Over 2,000 RPM with each engine. Quite a wash out the back. Excellent. MTBs were fast for a reason. To launch torpedoes at enemy ships and get away as quickly as possible. So they were built of wood to run light and fast. And as they had no armour, their speed was crucial to success. Because of their size and the havoc they caused, the fast motorboats were nicknamed the Mosquito Navy. Small, irritating and deadly. Huge battleships struggled to defend themselves against the speedy, manoeuvrable torpedo boats. So the British Navy started work on mid-sized ships that were fast enough to take on the MTBs and any other enemy vessel. They were called destroyers, and by World War II, they were very fast indeed. HMS Cavalier was a massive 110 metres long and weighed nearly 2,500 tonnes. And yet she was able to slice through the ocean at speeds designers thought would be impossible for a ship this size. All ships have a theoretical top speed. Cavalier's was 28 knots, but she managed 32. So how did she do it? Cavalier's speed came from the 40,000 horsepower generated by a whacking great steam turbine power unit buried deep in the hull and stretching half the length of the ship. Time to get my hands on some big machinery. This is Cavalier's forward boiler room. In the good old days, steam to drive the engines came from burning coal, solid fuel that had to be loaded by hand, stored in bulk, then shoveled lump by lump into the furnaces. Very inefficient. But HMS Cavalier's boilers were oil-fired, which meant that the fuel could be stored and moved around much more easily. So, how does it work? Well, it's quite simple, really. The fuel oil comes down this pipe here and then into eight spray assemblies. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, via these pipes here, which are controlled by these valves. Once inside, the oil is sprayed deep into the furnace where it burns, it heats the air, which boils the water, which creates steam. More oil equals more heat, which equals more steam, which equals more power to the engines. At full tilt, she burnt seven tons of oil an hour. The steam the boilers generated was piped to the engine room to drive the ship along. So here we are in the engine room of HMS Cavalier, two enormous turbines, one and two. And if we take a look at our demonstration turbine here, steam comes in here, drives the turbine, which via this rudimentary gearbox drives the propeller. 
The more steam that could be channeled into these babies, the faster they would spin and the faster Cavalier would romp through the ocean. You could almost fit these turbines inside the cylinders on HMS Warrior's massive steam engine, yet they developed almost eight times the power. One crucial benefit of turbines was that they did away with the vibration caused by the massive cranks and connecting rods of a reciprocating piston engine. The turbines could spin incredibly fast without shaking the ship to pieces. Good news not only for speed, but also for crew comfort. What would you like, Captain? Cigarettes? Biscuits? Lovely line in soup, sir. Nothing to do. All right, sir. But speed isn't just about power, it's also about shape. Making ships streamlined, long and thin, as well as monstrously powerful, allowed them to break their theoretical top speed, or hull speed. HMS Cavalier should only have been capable of 28 knots, but she could hammer along at more than 32. She broke her hull speed by using a combination of huge amounts of power and good hull design. Warships were getting faster, but naval battles were brutal, and they were still vulnerable to attack from aircraft, submarines and other ships. During the Great War and the Second World War combined, thousands upon thousands of sailors lost their lives on ships like this. As weapons became ever more deadly, it was vital that warships evolved to outrun or hide from the enemy. Over the last 50 years, technology has brought about a complete shift in naval warfare. The modern warship needs to have the right combination of speed and stealth, or the ability to hide, to outwit the enemy. Come on, number one! Oh, that's me! I've come to the Yupin Niemi naval base in Finland to see just such a modern warship for myself. If I could only find her. Ah, there she is. This is fast attack craft FNS Finnish naval ship Hamina. She's a high-speed, high-tech machine that's armed to the teeth and virtually undetectable on radar. A true 21st century warship. And she needs to be. Today, torpedoes aren't the only threat. Modern missiles can be fired long before an enemy is in visual range, using radar to guide them into their target for a hit. So Hamina is built to be invisible, with large flat surfaces, sharp angles and special composites that absorb or deflect enemy radar harmlessly away. Hamina is packed with gadgets to avoid being detected. Many are top secret, but I can show you one thing. Enemy missiles pick up the heat given off by a ship, so how do you cool down? Well, you take a shower, of course. Now, if I press this button here, I'll show you what I mean. A sea spray cools down the superstructure of the ship, making it more difficult for a missile to detect you. Ingenious! Hamina packs a mean punch too. Eight surface-to-air missiles and four surface-to-surface -surface missiles with a range of 60 miles ensure that she can deal with any threat. Finally, there's a 57mm Bofors gun, not to attack enemy ships, but to shoot enemy missiles out of the sky. Hamana is a rapid response craft, so her stealth and firepower would be absolutely useless without speed. Capable of over 32 knots, she can cover the 150 miles or thereabouts of the Finnish archipelago in a little over five hours. Handy. The rules of hull speed say that the shorter a ship is, the slower it goes. And at 51 metres, Hamina should only be capable of 18 knots. But rules are made to be broken. One solution is to be very light. Hamina is incredibly light thanks to her aluminium hull and super light carbon fibre frame. 
She may be half the length of HMS Cavalier, but at 250 tons, she's a mere one-tenth of the weight. This allows her to ride higher in the water, reducing drag and increasing top speed. Even so, it would be almost impossible for any conventional propeller-driven ship this short to shove herself through the water at 32 knots. So Hamina doesn't use propellers, she uses water jets. Here at the stern are two of these giant nozzles pumping out water at a rate of 10 tonnes per second. This whole ship is just a massive jet ski with guns. Jets are much more efficient than propellers at high speed, generating enough thrust to power this boat to almost double its hull speed. The water jets at the stern are powered by two V16 marine diesels, each with five turbochargers, and each engine, this is just one of them, pumping out 4,500 horsepower. These diesels drive pumps which suck water from beneath the ship through two massive pipes and squirt it out of the nozzles at the stern, powering her along. Now, although the ship's doing 30 knots, there's not a soul around. Gone are the labour-intensive days of steam when men were sweating it out down below, shoveling the coal. In fact, the whole ship is actually driven by just one man. With her highly automated weapon systems, stealth capabilities and speed, Hamana can defend herself against or launch an attack on any enemy vessel. Hamana is fast and lethal. She may be something of a giant jet ski, but at heart she's a truly impressive modern warship. And with her ability to virtually disappear, She's a real force to be reckoned with. Well, in just a moment, a race to the finishing line for the men who drive Canada's ice highway. We're on the road, or indeed on the ice, I suppose I should say, really, with the ice road truckers in just a moment.